So we're going to start out this morning. I get I'm a little computer challenge, so we're going to do this with a talk. Um, with uh, Dr. Beard coming up, talking about rectal em embryology and functional anatomy. Dr. Beard, all of you know, he's the director of the Colorectal Surgery Institute, um, and he's going to educate us a bit on the anatomy. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I found this to be a, a sort of a difficult and very dry subject to uh, when it was first assigned, so I've changed it a little bit. <laughs> it was not originally functional anatomy. Um, you know, this is one of those things that's sort of like the uh, Elizabeth Taylor's uh, seventh husband on their wedding night. He knew what to do, but he didn't know how to make it interesting. Well, I'm going to try and make this a little more interesting by making it a more functionally oriented um, uh, topic. Um, from an embryological standpoint, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that because from a management or functional standpoint, it's not particularly relevant. But the colon, and particularly the pelvis and the rectum, really be begins to uh, form at about nine weeks. This is the size of a, a nine, what a nine-week embryo looks like, and if you were to do a pelvic transection at that point, you'd see a number of organs that are started. Uh, the urogenital area is, is, working, is forming, uh, the genital cord is here, the liver is already forming, uh, the bladder is up here. Here we see the, the bowel or the colon, the rectum forming. And we know that they form in the cold, the bowel actually goes through a rather significant rotation and contortion as time goes on, uh, which in the adult population is not uh, particularly uh, important or relevant. Eventually, however, the colon or rectum makes its way down and joins the skin at this level here we call the dentate line. And uh, that's up, actually up inside the anus, and I think that's an important consideration to remember as we go forward and that will be relevant. So we have the rectum, which is generally called, uh, referred to as about the last 15 centimeters of the colon. And there are some uh, special features to that that uh, we've come to recognize. There are these valves. Um, their role is not clear, but they are persistent folds that we find. Uh, what they really do, we don't know. Um, we have the levator muscles, which is like a floor. Uh, if you think of your body, um, if the pelvis is like a funnel and it's open at the bottom and these muscles are the floor that support all the abdominal contents and uh, they actually have a lot to do and if they get strained if these levator muscles get strained they can cause pain and, uh, and other problems. Um, we have functionally here two parts from my standpoint. When you think about what allows you to be continent, what allows you to sit in this room for this period of time and not embarrass yourself. They're really functionally two things. One is a storage area, which we call the rectum from an anatomic standpoint, and the other is a plug or uh, something that keeps stuff inside until you're ready to let it out. Now, uh, we call that a sphincter. A sphincter is dynamic, but it doesn't have to be dynamic. It could be a cork. It could be a wire. It could be a piece of mesh. Uh, and in fact, people implant balloons around there, or now we're even implanting magnets around there to provide something called outlet resistance. In other words, it, there's a lot of different features, but think of this in terms of resistance. And resistance is a function not only of the pressure that that exerts, but also the length over which that pressure is exerted, okay? And that's resistance. It's like an electrical wire. An electrical wire has a feature called resistance, and it's a characteristic not only of how big around the wire is, but how long the wire is. And well, it's the same way for this outlet resistance. The storage area has a couple of features to it that we'll see. One is it has capacity, okay? That is, it has to hold a certain volume. Understanding that anatomy and that feature is important. The other is it needs to be compliant. That means as it fills up, it can't generate high pressures. The pressures have to be kept low. This is a feature that's true for other reservoirs as well, such as the bladder, or the stomach, or the gallbladder. Those are all storage areas, or reservoirs in your body. They all have the same features. They have capacity, and they have compliance. That means as they stretch, 
They don't generate a high pressure. If the pressure was too high, it would overwhelm the outlet resistance and you would leak. Okay? So when you see patients that are coming in complaining of leakage, incontinence and so on, it's a feature of one of those two. So either their <coughs> reservoir doesn't work or their outlet resistance isn't enough. So that's the anatomic sort of relevance of all this. Looking at it in some greater detail, um, we see the crypts here, which are, represent where the bowel was sort of gathered uh, to join the skin. Um, and you see coming off of these crypts, uh, in about 12 or 8 of them, we see a little gland. This gland, the apex of it sits in the groove between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter. Okay, so there are two muscles here. Um, and that little gland you see coming off there, and we'll see the relevance of that from a functional standpoint a little bit. We don't know what that's from. Is that a remnant of the pre gland of the duck? I mean, I don't know what that is. But anyway, those glands do exist, and they do cause us trouble, as we'll see. Well, there's also a, that was sort of a anterior-posterior anatomy. There's also a sagittal or sideway anatomy, and uh, we'll see this demonstrated in several, <coughs> several pictures, but uh, we see, the, again, the internal and external sphincter muscles here. And then uh, we see this muscle here. This is called the puborectalis muscle. And you can see that this muscle is attached to the pubic bone in the front, and it's pulling the, uh, the uh, rectum forward. And uh, that creates an anal rectal angle. Now, that adds resistance in a couple of ways. First of all, if it's too straight, the things sort of tend to run out. So you need to have an anal rectal angle. But more than that, when you cough, when you bear down, uh, particularly if you're not squatting, but if you're just standing and you cough or sitting and bear down, this angle, this the pressure actually pushes down on this and makes that angle sharper, making it harder for stuff to come out. Okay? And that's actually a problem. Some people forget how to straighten this angle out. And when they, when they bear down, they actually make it worse, and we call that an isthmus. They don't open up this angle appropriately. You, uh, when, one of the things when you want to defecate is you have to relax this muscle a little bit and you sort of do it automatically but people after surgery sometimes forget that muscle is pulling making the angle worse rather than relaxing and uh, they can't defecate well <coughs> looking at it from the bottom now a different, again a different view we see that uh, the levator muscles which are the four we talked about are wrapped around the rectum and sort of wrap and become the sphincter mechanism down low. And the reason that's important is they have a common innervation, a common blood supply. Remember that a muscle that doesn't have a nerve dies, doesn't work. So the fact that uh, these have a common uh, nerve source, if that nerve gets injured, as we'll see it can in several circumstances, then they lose, um, uh, lose control of those muscles. And we get something called perineal descent. You see the pelvic floor becomes very relaxed, and instead of being sort of supportive, it's like a trampoline. It just drops way down, and it'll drop inches when you strain. Looking at it from the bottom, we see, again, the levator muscles here, and here we see a muscle called the puborectalis muscle, cleverly uh, named because it starts at the pubic bone and goes back around the rectum and actually ties into the coccyx here. It also goes around the vagina, as you see here. And so it's a muscle that's common to all those. It's the muscle that, remember, pulls anteriorly in part. Now, one of the things that's sort of unique here is you see that uh, it doesn't go all the way around uh, the uh, anus. It sort of goes around both sides, but it leaves a little gap in the front and the back. And there are certain problems that occur uniquely in that spot, which we think is related to the fact that the anatomic support is not as good there. And pr primarily, they're fissures and we'll, we'll show you some pictures of those. Now, we have the ability today to do testing of these. Now, you may wonder, how do we know how this works? I mean, when you're sitting there, it's very hard to discriminate how much is due to the reservoir function, how much is due to the sphincter function. What are the roles of nerves in all this? How do I know when I'm going to have a bowel movement? How do I know when I have to uh, pass gas? How do I discriminate gas from stool? Well, it's very hard to do research in this area, much easier to do research on something simple like the heart. This is very complex. <laughs> the, way, the way we've done that over years is by taking away certain things. So, for instance, 
if I take out the rectum, well, let me, before I do that, let me just say we have this testing. We have the ability to blow up a balloon in here and measure the pressures in that rectum, and we measure the pressures in the anal canal also uh, with little balloons, or we actually lose electronic devices today, but I think this is graphically a little easier to appreciate, and the relationship between the two. So uh, let's just talk about that a little bit now. So from an anatomic standpoint, uh, the sphincter is uh, quite different between males and females. It tends to be about a centimeter uh, or so in uh, thin female, and is up to seven centimeters in length in the uh, husky male. So we're talking about substantial differences in outlet resistance. Because remember we talked about the, it's not only the pressure, but the length over which that pressure uh, occurs. So men have a much, much lower incidence of incontinence uh, than women. Um, we see that we talked about the valves and we don't really know their function and so forth. Now, in terms of how do we know how these different things work? Well, let me just tell you some observations we can make. We have the ability surgically to go in and to take out this rectum. Okay, now, I can replace it with bowel from above and sew it in at this level. And in fact, when we do that, uh, the people have good continence. Uh, they can have uh, a pretty good reservoir. We can replace it, we can make a bigger reservoir by making a pouch. And we find that there is a relationship between the size of the reservoir and the, si and the outlet resistance, and that is actually a formula. We have a formula that can predict how patients will do based on the relationship between outlet resistance and reservoir function. Well, you know, when we did that, we also detached all the nerves from here. And we brought down bowel from above that doesn't have the same nerves in it. Okay? Yet those, and, we, and for many years we thought that you had to have the lower part of this rectum in order to discriminate impending evacuation and also dis, to discriminate stool from gas. In fact, you don't. We can discri discriminate those even though we've got colon from above. And in fact, 75% of people who have their entire colon removed and you put in a, a piece of small bowel down here can still discriminate gas from stool reliably. So the uh, nervous innervation down here is probably intrinsic to the bowel, unrelated to the nerves that innervate the muscles uh, here or that uh, come from above. So that's sort of an interesting observation that you know, we've sort of made with time. So uh, we also, by doing that, uh, are able to understand a little bit about, more about ner the nerves to the um, perineum and to the uh, sphincter muscles in particular, the pedendal nerves. Uh, we know that they come from the sacrum, uh, uh, sacral bodies S2, 3, and 4, and that as long as uh, we go in and if we go in and have to take out some of those nerves, we know that as long as we preserve S2 and 3 on one side, um, their nerve function and their muscle function will remain good. Uh, so we don't need all of those nerves. But if we lose all of those nerves through radiation or some other feature or childbirth, often those nerves are damaged uh, during childbirth, uh, they may not recover. Most of them do, even if they're damaged. I'm going to show you some pictures of somebody with a problem called rectal prolapse, where the rectum comes out, and when it does, it pulls on the nerves, and you get a traction neuropathy. Uh, at least 50% of people will uh, have no nerve function who have rectal prolapse, and those muscles then weaken over time and, in fact, can become very lax. But if you return the bowel to the abdomen, those nerves will return to normal, and the muscle function will uh, return to normal as well. So those are some of the ways by looking at our surgical experiences, removing certain functions, removing certain organs or parts, we can begin to discriminate what part is responsible for which function. <laughs>